Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the correct views. Sam I B reporting for the Media Speaks. Let me shut my intro off here. This is by far and away the most important announcement that I have ever put up on the correct views. When I was a 14 year old, uh, I think I was like, four, I, I'm almost sure I was 14, I was in junior high school, and I promoted a, uh, a petition against the PMRC, knowing that people under the age of 18 year olds old could not vote. However, I wanted to let them know just how much money was being made. I was against the PMRC because the PMRC had no business doing what it was doing. I thought that it was... Uh, it led us down the road to censorship. It's the beginning, well not the beginning, but it's definitely one step. Um, I felt, even at a very young age, I felt that it was one step towards allowing the authorities to take over the role of the parent. It is the parent's job to teach a child fact from fiction, like my dad did back in the early 80s when I found heavy metal. One of my stories, ever since I was a very young adult, a very, I was a teenager, I wasn't even a young adult yet, I was a teenager, I've always had an interest in how things work. I tried to go to college, and there wasn't a whole lot of money for me to go to college, thank you, my behind the scenes Queen Christelle. There wasn't a lot of money for me to go to college, so I worked, and I worked hard. I worked at telemarketing offices. I worked at music stores. I worked as a cab driver. Talk about a thankless job. Um, pizza delivery jobs, DJing jobs, which uh, I'm actually at now and I, I make a decent wage. Um, every other job other than that have been abysmal. And I've wondered throughout my life, how do these things happen? Why is it that I have the knowledge to open a, a, a really good uh, nightclub tomorrow? Bam! Done. But there's so much red tape involved that I can't get it done. And as I got older, I didn't change. I understood more and more and more. For those of you that don't know, I'm 40 years old. Um, I began to wonder what kinds of opportunities could exist if these restrictions weren't there? What if all that red tape wasn't there? What if I had a chance to actually speak for people like me? People that have worked hard their whole lives. People that have, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to lie about who I am. I'm a DJ, I've been in a band, but I also have a degree from Stark State College and I worked very, very hard to get it. Um, and I know a lot about history, and I know a lot about what works in the real world and what doesn't. Having said that, at the Arcadia Grill on November the 2nd, I will be doing a live correct views from 9 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. It is for the McKinley Maslin game. Make sure you come out. Maria's Arcadia Bar and Grill. They're going to have a parade. They're going to have breakfast. They're going to have all kinds of activities for the game. And they are also letting me start a signature bomb because I, Samuel DeGangi, do now officially announce that I will be running for the Ohio House. And I am asking for your signatures because if I don't get your signatures, I'm a guy speaking all alone in a room to himself, and that's fine. If I were to lose this election, if I were to lose this, this I'm not going to give up. I'm going to continue doing everything I've always done, and be that musically or be that politically, and of course with this show. But there are people out there that know exactly what I'm talking about. There are people out there that know full well that they could get a lot further in this world if there were a few less restrictions. Uh, I don't mean anarchy in the streets, survival of the fittest, but I do mean a constitutional and libertarian um, outlook. And that's a good thing, because I believe that a lot of rights that the federal government has are rights that the state should have. 
guess what? I'm running for the Ohio House if I get this. That's a big F. It's up to you if I get this. That means I think that these states deserve rights. And I will stand up for what the Constitution says. I don't have to give you my platform. I've got videos that go back forever. YouTube deleted a whole years of my videos uh, by accident and never gave them back. You guys know exactly where I stand. If you would like someone like me to be in office, you've got it. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to act. I'm going to go. And I'm going to go absolutely nowhere without your help. How can you help? Um, I can only have libertarians and independents sign my petition. If you are a libertarian or an independent, I need you to go to the Arcadia Grill on November the 2nd on Court Avenue in downtown Canton between 9 and 1, and I need you to sign my petition to, to get me to run. And uh, from there on up, um, Mr. Paul Hines, who has been wonderful towards me, we will take our next step together. If I don't get the names, I don't run. I've got till February to get my names, but I've run into something. I have a lot of people, thankfully, that do support me quite a bit. But everybody that listens to me, everybody who I've had influence over, I personally begged them to sign up for the Republican Party so that they could vote for Ron Paul in the primaries. By doing so, all the people that would usually support me, who were independents uh, prior, are now registered as Republican, because that's what I asked them to do, and I told them about Ron Paul, and they did it. So they can't help me. So I'm asking everybody within my district, I'm in Canton, Ohio, come to the Arcadia Grill on November the 2nd. Come sign my petition. Hop on the air with me. I'm going to be doing a live hangout like I am now. Join me. Come talk to me. Come talk with me. I'm doing it. And you know what? You notice my hair? I have long hair. I have tattoos. I've been in a band. I'm not going to run as somebody I'm not. My past, my job as a cab driver, my job uh, when I was telemarketing and practically starving to death, that's why I'm qualified for this. I have studied history. I've gone to college. I brought myself up. But I know what poverty is. So I know what education is, and I know what poverty is. And I know that the main thing that's holding Ohio back is the number of restrictions we have that gets in the way of the average person starting a business. That's part of my platform. And, uh, and that's all I've got to say, people. I'm in it. I'm not going to be tying my hair back unless, you know, of course I'm at a, a, a outside or something where it's blowing around or if it's, you know, an engagement. But basically I'm saying I'm not faking myself. I'm not going to cut my hair to look like a metrosexual. I'm not going to hide my tattoos. I'm not going to go on a suit everywhere I go. Uh, I'll probably look like this. It's why I picked a button shirt. It's how I look when I'm at work. I'm not going to be fake. I'm not going to be anybody that I've ever been before. Um, you know, some people will find pictures of me on stage, covered in stage blood, and if that offends you, you need to understand what theater is. I've also been in entertainment. This is not entertainment. This is me using what I believe and what I know to, to put into action everything I yak about into this camera. So there you have it. I'm doing it. It's my official statement. I'm doing it. I've heard uh, many people love Mr. Steven Slesnick. I'm not here to attack Mr. Steven Slesnick. And uh, again, I, I, I understand him to be who I would likely be running against. I'm not running on what other people have done. He's a wonderful person. I'm running on what I would like to do. And I won't be doing anything without your support. If Mr. Slesnick were to beat me, I'll be the first person to walk up to him and shake his hand. I'm not looking to fight anybody at all. I have ideas. And I'm going to take those ideas to you. I'm going to say, hey, look at my videos. Do you support what I've done? Do, do I sound like somebody who you would support? Good. Canton, Ohio, if, if you can vote for me in this district, I really need you at the Arcadia Grill on November 2nd. Because I'm running for the Ohio House. And the first step of that for me to do so is to even get on the ballot. I'm not running for the Ohio House if you don't. Having said that, my friends, thank you. I'm not going to go on and make a big deal out of it. 
I'll be mentioning it quite often if you follow me on Twitter or follow me on Facebook. I'd be a fool not to. But I got a show to do, and we're going to go on to the rest of the news. All right, friends, I noticed this. Um, Iran's Rouhani, Israel should sign non-nuclear treaty. You know what? I happen to believe that, and I'm going to tell you why, just as soon as I get something to drink. I've been at work all day, and my voice is dying. I'm against nuclear power because nuclear power doesn't normally create any problems. Alright, that's what they normally say, I'll take it. The problem is when it does create a problem, it creates a very big problem. It creates a problem that uh, because of half-lives never go away. It creates monumental problems when it goes bad. It's like taking a gun and uh, spinning uh, the chamber with one bullet in it, playing Russian roulette. Most of the time, nothing is going to happen. Sooner or later, something grisly is going to happen. Ask Chernobyl. Well, it is for that reason that I agree with Iran. Israel needs to sign the non-nuclear treaty. Also, Iran needs to cease its nuclear power plant uh, once. Why? Because it lives in an earthquake zone, for one, and we learned in uh, Japan just what a wonderful idea that was. And um, beyond that, I mean, the amount of terrorism that happens there. Uh, forget the Jews. Uh, one faction of uh, Islam may decide that it doesn't like the other, and guess where they're going to attack? The nuclear power plant. Plus, <coughs> do you mean to tell me that nobody that has the power to uh, sneak a uh, potential dirty bomb of plutonium out of that plant would ever do so to Israel? Well, say of only 1% of the uh, Islamists are terrorists. Okay. That means uh, for every 100 people that work in the nuclear power plant, one of them would like to make a dirty bomb and send it at the Jews. It also means that Shiite might decide to hate Sunni and might decide to hate something else and sabotage the nuclear power plant. I don't think America should have any nuclear power plants. In a nutshell, I don't think we should have nuclear power. But in terms of this weaponry, yes, I believe that uh, if Israel is asking other people to sign it, then it itself should sign it. And I think if Israel's neighbors continue to attack it as it has, then Israel has every right to defend itself. So I, I am neutral on this issue. I am not one side or the other. And if Israel ever gets mad at these little pamby attacks that come at it and really launch at somebody, don't be surprised. How many times could somebody do that to you before you did it? Iran has urged Israel to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Speaking at the UN General Assembly for the second time this week, President Hassan Rouhani called for a world disarmament conference to establish a nuclear-free zone in the Middle East. As long as nuclear weapons exist, the threat of their use exists, Rahani said, recalling the tragedies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Calling for a nuclear-free zone, the Middle East, Rahani said that Israel was the only country in the region that had not yet signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and that is true. Earlier Arab states proposed a non-binding resolution to the International Atomic Energy Agency calling for Israel to join the, non, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and submit its legal nuclear facilities to IAEA monitoring. It goes on that a member of states of the UN Nuclear Agency voted down the resolution. He stated that any use of nuclear weapons is a violation against humanity, stating that the world has waited too long for nuclear disarmament. I agree with all of that. My trouble is, there are factions within inside Iran, and I'm not talking about the misquote about wiping the Jews off the map. Uh, many people have said that Ark Medina Jerk was a, uh, was a misquote. Uh, let's forget that he was ever there. There are factions that have publicly stated 
that they would like to use a dirty bomb against Israel. And it seems to me the best thing to do is eliminate nuclear anything. Is that going to be done in my lifetime? Probably not. But we can take steps towards that direction, and I think it's important to do so. Almost four decades of international efforts to establish nuclear weapon-free zones have regrettably failed. He said, urgent practical steps toward the establishment of such zones are necessary. The international community has to redouble efforts in support of the establishment in this zone. Let me tell you something. Helen Caldercott has pointed this out many times. There is very little difference between the nuclear power industry and the nuclear weapons industry. One is used to make the other look good, and one is used to piggyback on the other and research for the other. And they're doing this at the threat of everyone's life watching this, and that is why I am against all things nuclear. <coughs> And David Attenborough, stop feeding third world nations to reduce population. Well, I'll tell you what, there are two things you might not know about me if you just tune in. Uh, one is sometimes I can get rather bombastic on here, and some people may wonder, well, if he's running for the house, he can't act like that on the floor. And they're correct. However, the way I'm going to address a camera in my own house is not necessarily the way that I would address a person if I was to... Um, Trying to, trying to convince them of my side, or trying to debate them in some way. Um, it's, two different, it's two different arenas, so the two aren't comparable. But I can say that I am against all things uh, like this, uh, and I think most of you should be. If not, there's something wrong with you. David Attenborough, stop feeding third world nations to reduce the population. First of all, let's get it clear that we do not have a population problem in the world. No, we don't. It is a matter of fact. You can look this up. It's very easy to search on Google. Everyone in the entire world could live in Texas comfortably if everyone in Texas had the exact same average living space as your average New York City dweller. That is not me speaking. That is me quoting absolute fact. Look it up. They're using this for two reasons. First of all, the elite want to be in control of everything. Look at the George of Guidestones and look how many of us they really want to kill in order to reach a perfect population. One of the ways to do that is to convince a bunch of pumpkin heads that there's too many people in the world. Second of all, and this isn't popular to say either, we have a very, very bad location issue in uh, this world. That is to say there are some areas of the world that people should not live in because you cannot grow food there and I don't care what your history is. And then, of course, there's greed. There's, uh, there's the way we market food and all of that, some of which is a necessity and some of which is not. Well, listen to this. Anthony Gucciardi, InfoWars. Top globalist Sir David Attenborough who last year described humans as a plague on Earth, has now gone on record in calling for nations to, of the world to stop sending food aid to starving nations in order to reduce the population of the world. What kind of human filth would say something like that? Speaking with the Daily Telegraph, the highly decorated psychopath, good wording, expanded upon his notion that the plague of humanity must be reduced throughout the world. Reduction, that according to him, really starts with starving poorer nations that have been decimated by first world powers. That in and of itself is a lie. Because while the nations of both First world and other world countries like North Korea can be questionable. America and the first world citizens have spent billions on aid to them. So that's the first lie right there. Confusing the, the leaders with the people. And could be fed for about a week or so of military spending. That is true. And that's very true. The problem, Matt Burrell says, however, comes down to numerous huge sensitivities that continue to block the goal of massive population reduction. And what are these huge sensitivities, it asks? 
Well, it turns out that the sensitivities blocking the decimation of the world's human population include the right to have children. And this nutcase wants to take away the right to have children. How truly horrible. Instead, it seems Attenborough thinks that we should revoke the right of citizens to have children, let alone feed the existing humans and hungry nations. In the interview, Attenborough writes, We say get the United Nations to send them bags of flour. That's Barney. Oh, and I thought I was bad for just suggesting that uh, people should use the thinking part of their brains and move. Or be moved if they're poor. Now, perhaps the most alarming thing to note here is that this psychopath who justifies his genocide with faulty reasoning is considered a national treasure in Britain. Well, I guess that's what their treasury must look like. Yeah, that's better. Edinburgh has also 31 honorary degrees from British universities, which is more than any other person. Now you know why we seceded. This is in addition to his numerous royal titles. Last paragraph. Truly, Attenborough's comments are being met with mainstream media attention. In a positive light, shows just how far gone the media really is. Ultimately, there is a war on our right to not only have a family and basic necessities, but knife itself. If Attenborough wants to reduce the population and starve entire nations to death, why does he not offer up himself first? Well, that's because he thinks he's better than everyone else. Guys, do me a favor. Go to TheMediaSpeaks.com and click on Bud K. Now, please do it in that order, because when you go to the Media Speaks and click on Bud K, every penny that you donate to this show goes towards a better correct views. Every penny you would give to the Media Speaks goes towards better Media Speaks. We can be out here more. We can do more things. We could run for the Ohio House. Um, it all comes down to you. And how many of you have had a, I got a tight budget going into our Christmas this year? Anybody? All right. Listen to this. The 160-foot spool of GI trip wire and airsoft and survival snare is $4.99. You know anybody that's into any survivalism? No, maybe not. All right. Do you know anybody that enjoys James Bond? I said this last time. Buy a James Bond movie or buy some kind of spy movie like Born Identity and then get them this. It's $3.98. The black ink pen knife, $3.98. It's a pen that's also a knife. It's a novelty thing, but I mean, those two gifts together. How much is a, a copy of one of those films I mentioned? And then that knife, you get around like $20 there. The 11 function credit card survival tool, Bud K, $1.99. And they've even got an emergency survival sleeping blanket for $1.99. You might think you never need that. Well, maybe not if you don't, you know, if you don't live where I do. Uh, periodically, you know what? Things go out. The lights go out. There's no electricity. There's no nothing. What if you're trapped outside? You can't even go into a building to get warm. $1.99. You got a survival blanket. Click on TheMediaSpeaks.com and then click on Bud okay. Two more stories. I kept it short because I announced uh, the earlier house run. That ate up some of the show time. But don't worry. I'll be going over all of the topics at uh, the Arcadia Grill on November 2nd. Um, I'm going to do like I did during the spring cleaning. I'm just going to go. If people want to talk about football, they can talk about football. If people want to promote their new CD. People want to talk whatever. You hop on the air with me. I don't care. You want to know what I believe. You want to know what you'll be supporting if you support me. I'm an open book. All right, guys, Fox News. <coughs> Police in Florida suburb make millions from drug sting operation report fines. This is dreadful. Police in Florida have been luring big money drug buyers to a small suburban town across the United States and as far north as Canada, negotiating sales of cocaine in popular restaurants and then arresting the buyers and confiscating their cash in cars. According to a six-month investigation by Sun Sentinel, undercover, undercover detectives in Sunrise, Florida seized millions of dollars from the drug stings, offering cash rewards for the confidential informants who help attract faraway buyers, including paying one informant more than $800,000 over the past five years. This is why I really think drugs need to be legalized and policed and monitored. Areas that have done this 
have seen much, I've seen a massive reduction in crime and cost. People aren't got, got a, are going to stop using these sorts of things, unfortunately. The good news is, is that, you know, there's better ways to do it than the war on drugs, which is rife with construct, uh, just, um, corruption, and uh, exactly the kind of thing we're seeing right here. Look, the paper's investigation has led the police department to stop the cocaine stings with Mayor Michael Ryan, who supports the police work, blaming the Sun Sentinel for exposing department strategies and compromising the undercover work. Oh, yeah, that, 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 it, it's not, nothing against the, uh, the rights of people or anything. It's just their work. Siga Heil. In announcing the end of the program, Ryan did not address the huge overtime payments the police earned or the expensive incentives rewarding a network of secret informants, the paper reported. In one instant, a sergeant running the stings collected more than $240,000 in overtime during a three-and-a-half-year period. In other words, the war on drugs is always about just money. We've known that for a while now. In a review of payola, payroll data, I meant payola, the Sun Sentinel found dozens of narcotics officers since 2010 have collectively earned $1.2 million in overtime pay. I wonder how many non-violent drug offenders got caught up on that that we're all paying for. Well, at least all of you in Florida. Police in Sunrise have been conducting what are known as reverse stings for years, according to the Sun Sentinel, and over the past two years have netted $5.8 million in seized money. It's probably where they spent. And they can take their cars, jewelry, Sun Sentinel reporter Megan O'Matt said, who broke the story with colleague John Maines, told ABC News. One fella told us that cops said, hey, I like the sunglasses you're wearing, and snatched them. So there is a real profit motive for the police practically printing their own money. According to the story by Maines and O'Matt, the Sunrise suburb is hauling in three times as much forfeited as any other city in Broward and Palm Beach counties. The next biggest haul for the 2011-2012 period was 1.8 million seized by Fort Lauderdale. Now I'm going to read some more because this is disgusting. Since 09, according to the Sun Sentinel report, Sunrise has arrested at least 190 people on cocaine trafficking charges. That is more than any other municipality in the country. I bet. Only seven of those arrested lived in Sunrise. It says Sunrise is extraordinarily in the amount of cases they produce, Fort Lauderdale defense attorney Martin Roth told the paper. That might be a good or bad thing depending on your point of view. You, 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 the point is, what we're doing is... It's like when you hear for the children. You know whenever you hear, <laughs> it's, it's for the children. You know whenever you hear that, what they really mean is hose the adults. Um, it's the same thing here. Nobody wants a cokehead stealing things from their house. What they're not telling you is this is a private decision. And that isn't up to the federal government. Now, policing drugs is a great idea. Keeping the idiots that use them monitored is a pretty good idea. But doing what we're doing is creating gangs, creating violence, and hurting people. And that is a very bad idea. The last story I'm going to get to, low fast food wages supplemented by billions in government welfare RT. I'm not against saying goodbye to the dollar menu at McDonald's. If that means that these people are going to get a decent wage. And the reason I feel that way isn't because I don't remember what it's like to be so poor that that's all you can eat. Because I'll tell you what, it wouldn't take very much for me to end up being one of those people again tomorrow. I am better than absolutely nobody. What I'm saying is we are already paying $2 a cheeseburger. Because we're paying the people that work in these industries so little. And we're allowing these corporations to pay people that work in fast food so little. That they are eligible for welfare, as they should be, under the current system. And we're paying by getting a cheaper cheeseburger and then paying a fortune to cover their welfare costs. There wouldn't be these welfare costs if the fast food jobs paid better. Listen to this. 
Over half of U.S. workers employed by fast food restaurants rely on public assistance because their meager paychecks do not cover the basic needs. The aid costs American taxpayers, that would be you and I, billions of dollars each year according to a new report. The average American fast food worker earns $8.69 an hour and regularly works less than 40 hours a week, qualifying them for a variety of government benefits. Benefits. 52% of families that include a fast food worker receive food stamps, Medicaid, or are they are eligible for earned income tax credit or temporary assistance for needy families. Compare that sum with the 25% of families eligible for those assistance programs from the overall workforce. And I'll admit, I, when I was uh, with my wife, we were so destitute for a while that she got benefits. And uh, this was a lot of it. This, this idea that we got a 99 cent cheeseburger, but we're paying $3 in welfare as we drive away. Um, it's important to listen to. This is not anti-poor, this is pro-poor. This is about trying to make sure that the poor have enough money that they don't need welfare. So don't tell me I'm anti-poor. I'm, I, I know what poverty is. Trust me. Researchers determined that non-managerial employees, such as cashiers, cooks, servers, and others, are twice as likely to need financial help. They deemed it staggering how government assistance programs effectively pay costs that major food chains refuse to cut and dry. Most fast food, most fast food workers, 68%, are single or married adults not currently attending school, and 20% are raising children, debunking the stereotype that teenagers fill most of said positions. In other words, it's not all filled by kids coming up. The numbers were assembled in a report written by economists from the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, for those of you that want sources. Published Tuesday, the report is affiliated with an organization that has lobbied for the Service Employees International Union's involvement in the fast food industry and comes after workers throughout the U.S. have called for higher wages and safer working conditions. <coughs> and I agree totally. Only 13% of workers receive health benefits from their employers, compared to 59% of workers elsewhere. elsewhere. An individual working at McDonald's or Burger King, for example, also works an average of 10 hours less than his or her full-time counterpart working for a non-fast food company. The study examined the years between 07 and 11, determining the taxpayers subsidized the industry by an average rate of $7 billion a year. Now do you still believe that your cheeseburger was really only 99 cents? Conservative, how many people are in the country? We've already paid $2 for it when you think about it. When you think about how many people are working, it's more than $2. We're already paying $3 a burger. Dummies. Conservative groups mobilized against the report before its Tuesday publication, claiming the authors exaggerated their findings for the sake of making a political statement. No. We are all paying more than 99 cents. For every 99 cent cheeseburger that we eat, we're paying $3. That is because that is the difference that we are paying in welfare that comes out of our check. I am not in favor of taking people and throwing them off of welfare. I am in favor of getting our house in order and getting people the kind of jobs that they can have that will allow them to take themselves off of welfare because they're being paid a decent rate. And maybe instead of paying $3 for a cheeseburger, which is really what we're doing now when we buy a 99 cent cheeseburger, if you were to do it the way I just laid out, then what you would find is you are now paying $2 at the window. And that's it. Because the welfare numbers would go down if they made more money. In essence, even though you're paying more at the window, you would be paying a dollar less for each cheeseburger. You are listening to Sam I. B. DeGangi of The Correct Views of The Media Speaks. Go to TheMediaSpeaks.com. Look up the work of Kyle Court D. Lake and myself. Also, do me a huge favor. Be at the Arcadia Grill November 2nd in Canton, Ohio. 
If you're registered as independent or libertarian, I need you there or I can't get this done. Please donate to Ms. Dana Mowgli Christ and support, support the Arcadia Grill. They have delicious food. Um, they've been a sponsor on here before. And also, I mean, when my dad died, that's where we held the calling hours uh, meal. So when I tell you that, that they have done great things for us, I'm telling you their food is delicious from firsthand experience. Thank you for listening, friends. Good night and God bless. And good night to my live listening friends.